This video is about World War III and how we can better understand the war that we are currently in. And so when I am talking about World War III, at this time, people are probably thinking that I'm referring to the things going on with Ukraine, and maybe I'm trying to say that Ukraine and the situation with Russia invading is a uh, key component or precedes World War III or is the beginning of World War III. That's not what I'm saying. As a matter of fact, we are in World War III. It has been going on uh, at least for the last two years. It has been a heavy, hot war. And what is happening in Ukraine with Russia and the results of that, it's really more, more important is the results of it, the fruits of this particular invasion. Let us know the nature of the war. Let us know the nature of the age that we are in and give us some ability to predict what is coming next and to see what things we should be focused on. And so I wanted to do this video to give some insight into the framework that I'm working with that allows me to say that and why I, I can be speak very surely that this is what's happening. And also hopefully to give you some insight, I wanna share this framework and give you some insight so that you can begin to see what's going on for what it is and to not get caught up in, let's say, the sideshow, but to focus on what's important. That's really the big key thing here is to focus on what's important. There's many things to focus on and there's many things that even by our own temperament or our own experience, we may think are the most important things. But at any given time, depending upon what age you're in, you will benefit the most by focusing on the things that are important to that age. So what do I mean by the age that we're in? I'm going to give you the framework that I'm working with, and then we're going to talk about how we can understand the world as it's laying itself out, and particularly as it's laid itself out, let's say just over the last 60 days, over the last two months, it gives us so much to look at and so much to be able to tell where this thing is going based upon things that we have known leading up to here, what are the things that we should focus on? Uh, I've been focused on specific things because I've been working with this framework and it is just every day playing itself out in exactly the way that I have predicted that it would and as I would expect it to do. Not necessarily the specifics, but the general momentum, the general, let's say, storyline and narrative to get us from point A to point B. So let's talk about this framework. The framework that I'm referring to, I'm going to refer to it uh, from here on out, and I have referred to it in the past as the human social cycle. So this is a this name was given to this particular framework of understanding the cycles of history. Uh, was given to it by uh, it was uh, the name was given to this cycle by uh, P. R. Sarkar. Prabhat Ranjan Sarkar, who was a philosopher, guru in the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s in India. He is of the Tantra, tr Tantric tradition, not like Tantric sex, as everybody knows, but the Tantra tradition of uh, Hinduism. And his organization that he founded, which is still around to this day, is called Ananda Marga. It means the path of bliss. But he was uh, also a, a political philosopher and a philosopher of history, uh, prolific in terms of his writing, his speaking, uh, wrote songs, dances. And I was introduced to him by an early business mentor of mine, appropriately enough for this conversation, as you'll see, who was an Indian gentleman who had investments all over the place. He lived in Hong Kong with his family, and he taught me a lot. This was in my early 20s. I believe I was 21, 22 when I was working for him and, and working with his, his properties. And I'm very thankful that he, uh, he introduced me to the work of PR Sakar. I was actually initiated. His, his wife was, uh, and his family was well known in this organization. His wife's mother had been the first female devotee of PR Sakar. And so uh, I was 
around the the monks of Ananda Marga. I was initiated into their into their sect and practiced their meditation and read the the books. And I was most struck by this particular concept that P. R. Sakar brought forward. Now, what he says is that human society organizes itself into four distinct, let's say, energies. And that this is represented in the Hindu caste system, the caste system of India, which has four classes, you might say, of people. And you are born into a particular class. So whatever the class of your family has been, this is what you are born into. And this is the traditional uh, idea. And it basically breaks down into four classes. And the classes are commoner, which in the Sanskrit is Shudra, warrior, which in the Sanskrit is Kshatriya or Kshatriya. I've been told by my Indian friends, stop saying the K, it's just Kshatriya. So it's Kshatriya. There is a K, silent K to start that one out. That's the warrior. Then there is the thinker or intellectual class. This is also the priest class. So priests, academics, etc. And that is the Brahmin or P.R. Sakar uses Vipra which is a thinker, and then there is the merchant class, and that is Vaisha, or Vaisha. And so those four classes, Sarkar says, are in a, not only always exist in humanity, and he says everyone has a little bit of those energies inside of them, uh, but just as with individuals, different energies manifest more or less. So, and, and we'll talk a little bit about what those energies, what those energies look like. Just to know how ancient and, let's say, ubiquitous this is, interestingly enough, these are also the four suits of tarot, represented in the four suits of tarot, club for the commoner, spa, uh, sword, or espada, which is in the trading cards. So it's, it's clubs and wands in tarot, right? And clubs in the playing cards, swords in tarot is spades in the playing cards, espada, chalices or cups in the tarot, translated to hearts, which is the blood of Christ, which is what's in the cup, the chalice, in the playing cards, and uh, it's pentacles, which is a coin in tarot with a star on it, so it's actually coins uh, and diamonds, appropriately, for the merchant class in the, the playing cards. It's also represented by um, Adam, Cain, Noah, Abraham, if you look at them, they also represent the four. If you look at the sort of their attitudes and what they do, okay? So this is incredibly ancient. It's, it's this cycle and symbols, and they're in that order, mind you. <laughs> Always in this order as well, which is very interesting. And Sarkar says that these, all, as they manifest in, in individuals, more or less, they also will manifest in a society, more or less. And in a given society over time, they will move through a cycle. Of each other starting for in that exact order commoner will be the prevalent in a society then it will arrive to warrior which is the chiefs and the kings in a society then it will move to the thinkers which will be the priests and the intellectuals the academics in a society and then it will move to the merchants and you know we can know we can look at our society and we see who are the people that everybody is looking up to who are the people who are the heroes the elon musks of the world right but in other ages, merchants were seen as, especially in the warrior ages, merchants are seen as a, a lowly class of people. And they can't really get rich. There's no way for them to have wealth. There's no way for them to become nobility. This was some of the moves in the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is actually the rise of the merchant age, as we'll see. But some of the moves in the Enlightenment and the idea was, you know, the, the, the bourgeoisie, away from the aristocracy the aristocracy, who are warriors and also thinkers and priests, okay? So in this same way, we can understand war. This is very important for this conversation, for the, this concept that we're laying out here. If we look at a war, we can describe a war, and each of the individual members of a class, the different classes, might describe this war from their angle. And so the thing is to say, okay, well, what are the things that, the ideas, the concepts that are behind each of these classes? Let's say the good and the bad. What, what drives them? What are their incentives? 
What are they moving toward? Because they're all moving towards something. So the commoner, the shudra, the peasant, the everyday, this is everyday people. And we all have a lot of this inside of us. Everybody does. The motivation is survival. And the drive is very much about fear. And I think that when we look at this idea of like the NPC, in many ways, this is what we're talking about. Go along to get along. These people will, it's the herd. And why do you stick with the herd? Survival. Why don't you stray? Fear. Now, that could seem negative, but there's a great positive thing that comes out of Shudra. Because Shudra, see, this, this survival is also about survival of things that work. Part of survival is survival of not just the people, but the, the memes, the ideas. And so you get tradition. Tradition is a Shudra thing. The telling of the stories. The learning of the language. All of these things that are taught either around the campfire or by the mothers to, to the children that the grandmothers and grandfathers keep as the stories that they tell, the, the lessons, the ways to live, the things that make your tribe distinct. The dances, the ceremonies. These are kept by the Shudra energy. Preserva it's about preservation and survival. But there's a great fear of the, the outside. Don't go away from the campfire. Don't move in that direction. And we see this in certain people, right? Certain people have this energy about them. But the positive is, is tradition. And so the answer to that that arises or sort of the, everything goes towards entropy. So at a certain point, that is going to corrupt. At a certain point, tradition isn't going to work because new things happen in the world that we have to deal with. And the person in a Shudra society who deals with those things is the hero. This is the Kshatriya. This is the warrior. They're the people who are not afraid to go outside of the campfire. Isn't that the hero's journey? to go into unknown lands and to have an adventure. And they are very exploratory. They are explorers. Kshatriya are explorers. And they go out into the world. And their main drive is conquest. The conquering of fear. Conquering of themselves. Conquering of others. They want to go out and conquer. You, you look at what drives somebody like Alexander the Great? And you look at sort of what he was doing, and the entire thing is, how far can I go and keep conquering, keep testing myself? And so you can get this wanton recklessness. This is something that the Kshatriya may have. You can have them being bloodthirsty. You can, you can have them being uh, brutal and violent and always looking for a fight. But at the same time, they are the people who always want to conquer themselves. And we see Kshatriya everywhere. In our society, how do they manifest? So much so in sports and entertainment. So much so in sports and entertainment, right? Because it's, a it's all about competition. And most of it is the competition inside themselves. And somebody who would train by themselves and sweat and do all of this or sit in their room and learn guitar and write all these songs and one of the things about the Kshatriya is they're going to have, and this is the old aristocracy. So this is the aristocracy as well. The positive thing about the aristocracy, the positive thing about the Kshatriya, they love beauty. They love beauty. They bring it, it's art. A society that is a Kshatriya society is going to be replete with art because they're all about glory. And so they will want beautiful things to commemorate their glory. Statues. And this is how you, this is how you know the Kshatriya influence. You're going to see statues, commemorations of heroes, stories of heroes. And then at the same time, they, they're, they're, the things that they get, the treasures and all of this, they want to display them in beautiful ways to show their glory. So this is actually wonderful that you get this beauty aspect that comes from out of it. So with all of that, they, they want to fight, they want to go to war, but some are better than others. And there are some in the society that recognize and realize that some are better than others. 
And they start to develop theories about how to fight. And that's very helpful to the Kshatriyas. And so the Kshatriyas keep them around and they advise them. And they also start to develop theories about what is the what is good and what is bad because one of the things that Kshatriyas really want is they want glory we get honor actually that comes this idea of honor of fighting an honorable battle of sportsmanship of not cheating of playing by the rules because to win is not enough for an advanced Kshatriya society it has to be done in the right way and the ones who catalog and keep it all in the right way these are the thinkers the Brahmins or the Vipra and they are their whole mode of operation is all about describing the world with precision. Their tools are all about how can we precisely describe the world. Telescopes and down to microscopes and mathematics and physics and philosophy. And so this is what you get in the thinker world and also morality and also religion. What rituals work, all of this. Religion particularly, there's always rituals, but religion particularly, this is coming from the Vipra. And we had been living in a Vipra age. We were on the end of it. The Enlightenment was, let's say, the height of Vipra. Ideologies come from out of Vipra. And on the descent of Vipra, we get the rise of the merchant class. And they really kind of happen at the same time, right around the late 1700s. We get this rise of the merchant class who are the same families like the Rothschilds. I mean, the rise of the Rothschilds happens at the same time as the founding of the United States, pretty much in the same generation, right? The same people. So we see these, these, the crest and then the rise. And what are these individuals all about? Well, what the, the Vaishas are all about, the merchants, is control of resources. So they're all about resource management and that sort of control. And they want to have a, 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 a panopticon, a view of everything. And these Vaishas are people who are focused on the economics. So it's not just capitalists, it's also communists. They're both Vaishas. They disagree on on how society should be organized, on how resources should be managed. They disagree on that, just in the same way that a Muslim and a, a, a Muslim imam and a Christian priest disagree on the nature of God and the nature of religion and how people should pray and act. But they're both vipras. They're both Brahm, of the Brahmin class. Right? So we've been in that rise. So we can go back and, and look at the wars, and I would say World War II is absolutely a Vipra war. It's all about ideology. It's a war of ideologies. And when, when Vipras go to war, that's what it is. It's a war of ideologies. When they compete, they compete as representatives of their ideology. Think about debates academic, where two academics debate each other. They're not debating as them. They're debating as representatives of their given ideology or a given idea. They're going to debate as a representative of an idea. And this is what Vipras, Brahmins are all about. When Kshatriyas compete, oh no, no, no. Kshatriyas, they're competing as themselves. A rap battle, everything from a rap battle to uh, you know, a cage fight is gonna be these guys and they're going for the glory. Two athletes to a tennis match. Right? Or maybe it's a team of athletes, but it's about them as a team. It's, there's not some uber ideology that they are representative of. And they're just a representative of it. And they're going to argue that that's the better ideology. No, no, no. That's a Vipra way. Kshatriya is by themselves. The conflicts of the Shudra are these simmering tribal feuds. There's no glory, no nothing like that. It's just like, that's the other, we're against them, we hate them. Sometimes it may come to little blows in the streets, but it's just that that's the other, we fear them, we don't like them, even though they're basically the same people. Right? Two tribes across a valley might hate each other. And this is happened, this Hatfields and McCoys in Appalachia, right? But if you or I went to a Hatfield or a McCoy, we wouldn't know the difference. But oh, the Hatfields and McCoys know the difference between one another. And those feuds can go on for generations and generations. So the Vaisha, 
the merchants, their war, and this is very important, and this gets us, now that we have the framework, this gets us to understanding the war that we're in right now. Because it's about market dominance, market share. Your competitors, if you're a merchant, are those who are selling fundamentally the same goods that you are or that you want into that market and they've got the lock on the market and you've got to figure out a way of getting in for somebody to buy your thing instead of the other guy's thing. Because the Vaishas operate primarily, primarily, Vaishas need it to be voluntary. They're merchants, remember. They're not warriors. And they're not, they're not, they don't fight over ideology. It's really about the product at hand. And they get control of resources by you agreeing. So if Google gets control of your information, it's because you basically agreed to give it to them. You literally agreed. It's in the terms of service. Same with Facebook. You signed up for it. You signed up for this. So they need you to sign up for things. Now, part of the negative aspect of that is that because it needs to be voluntary, sometimes they need to go around screwing things up for you. Because ultimately, you're buying a solution to your problem. And this gets us into a very important part of this and a very important thing to understand about what's happened, especially over the last two years. Because if you look at who the winners have been, they're major corporations. Let's say the biggest winners, pharmaceutical corporations. And big retailers who had all their competitors shut down. Think about that. Walmart, Target, they stayed open. Not only did they stay open in places where there was lockdowns, CVS, Walgreens stayed open. But in places where there were lockdowns, a whole bunch of competitors of theirs where you could buy the same things weren't able to open, got shut down. Oh, they had, they had bumper years. They had some of the best years that they'd ever had. In terms of profits, those companies, think about it. So crises, crises can be very good for the Vaisha if they're correctly positioned. And a manufactured crisis is just as good as any other one. A crisis is just as good as any other crisis. And that brings us to where we are and what the world war that we are in right now. The world war that we are in right now, for lack of a better term, this is a poor term, but it's going to work for this. Okay, It's not precise, but it'll work for this. It's a currency war. It's a currency war. What we're in is we are in a, a reshuffling of the financial deck. And a lot of it has to do with the internet, and a lot of it has to do with digital currencies being a reality as a tool, primarily brought in by Bitcoin. And we know that Bitcoin is a massive tool because the U.S. is basing its own CBDC, Project Hamilton, on it. And don't think that these aren't related. All of this is absolutely related. Because what we're seeing now, and it's not being reported on, because they're focusing on the Kshatriyan aspects, the Vipran aspects, and the Shudra aspects of the situation that's happening in Ukraine. And very little time is being spent on what's happening economically, where the real war is taking place, and where it's being felt by you. See, you've been drafted. You've been drafted into this war. When you go to the pump, the gas pump, and the prices are higher, that's you've been drafted. These are the war rations. These are we all got to give in to the war effort, even as the president of the United States said just two days ago, as I'm recording this, he said, well, the price of these sanctions against Russia will not just fall on Russia. They'll fall on even including the United States. And what we see happening is we see the dollar ceasing to be the sole world reserve currency, and CC, and that is happening because of it no longer being the sole thing, dollars and euros, no longer being the sole thing through which countries can purchase energy, natural gas and oil. Because Russia is a big producer, this thing has set it off, these sanctions, is it organized? Its powers and principalities, as I speak about often, 
This is just an energy and people taking advantage of it. But what is happening is totally in line with what the people who are in control, a Vaishya class around the world, want. So what are the things that they want and how do you understand what's happening now? If you understand this, you will understand everything that's happening. And most importantly, that's being allowed to happen because that's what it is. These things are being allowed to happen and they're being nudged, just nudged. The Vipras, the Kshatriyas, the Shudras are being nudged by the Vaishyas. And that's all it takes is a nudge. What is going on? A new financial paradigm. This is what I've been telling everybody that you have to understand. What is being brought in is something that has been planned. It is a new financial paradigm. What it looks like for the average person is going to be a central bank digital currency, a digital currency that you use within your own country. These are country by country. They'll, a lot of them will be just clones of each other because they're not going to reinvent the wheel once they find a good one. They'll be clones of one another, run by the individual central banks. See, but you have to accept it. You have to take it. And the only way, and I know this working in this space, right? I've For years, I've built alternate payment systems and, and gone out to work to get merchants to adopt them. And one thing that I can tell you is merchants are not going to adopt new payment methods and redo their entire infrastructure, their payment infrastructure. It's a, it's a pain. If it's working, it works. If, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's your money. They're not going to go in and revamp the whole thing unless there's one of two things. One, there's either got to be a law and that they're forced to do it. This is like the euro. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen and nor is it needed in this situation. Or things have to get so bad or screwed up or there has to be such demand, right? So maybe three things. And this is what's going to be the two. So there's going to be absolutely, I don't know whether it's this year, I don't know whether it's next year, but in the course of this, there's going to be cyber attacks that take down the bank networks, that take down Visa network and some of these, make them unusable, make them difficult, affect banks to some degree, to a great enough degree that the media can be put into place so that that people will be open to these new safer systems. Also, there's going to be universal basic income, stimulus checks, gas offsets, whatever they're going to call it, money printed, and it's going to be delivered in the form of these central bank digital currencies. Okay, that's in the individual countries. So that's what your squeeze is about. You're being squeezed right now. So these sanctions, they serve that, knowing that, because people look and they're like, why is the United States committing suicide? Why is the United States making it so that the dollar is no longer the world reserve currency? This is going to blow up the economy. Yes, this is the point. It needs to blow up so that people will be like, okay, yeah, we'll take it. We'll take this thing. We got to take it. Like, let's take it. But the second part is even more important because it's at the international level. And if we look at the history of money, we look at the history of finance, where we see it first at the small scale, and then we see it at the, go to the large scale. And what's going to end up happening is there is going to be a new global reserve currency, right? But it's going to be, oh, it's not SWIFT. It's not done by the banks. It can't be shut down by any country. Every country is going to agree to it so that we could do this. It's how we're going to get back on track. It's how we're going to, to make it so that there's... They're going to say that there's confidence in the international energy market, confidence in the international food market, all of this. And that's going to be an international CBDC that's going to be settled internationally. That's how to understand it. So I will post links to some uh, talks and podcasts that I have done about this framework. If you'd like to know more, I'm going to be talking more about this as it goes along, but this is the introduction so that you can know what is coming and so that you can look and tell what the next things that are on the horizon are. Keep your eyes on the currency because that's what this is all about. This, that's what this is all going to, and it is a massive, massive control mechanism.